morning, everyone. Welcome to San Diego State University Chinese Culture Center's virtual cultural program today. Uh, uh, very welcome. And today's topic is Chinese cuisine culture. And uh, my name is Yudan Wang. I'm from uh, Chinese Culture Center and as a curator and developer. I'm very glad to meet you all. And I want to uh, pass this to my colleague, Mu Ting Huang. Good morning. It's great to be here and share the uh, Chinese culture and history with you. So for today's program, so we call it Chinese Culture Day and featuring Chinese cuisine. So before we uh, go to our main topic, the Chinese cuisine, so I would like to share you with a very uh, short video clip. Uh, in this video clip, uh, you will learn our Chinese culture center in the Chinese six hour. Thank you. Welcome to the Chinese culture center of San Diego State University. Behind me, is the great teacher of China, Confucius. Confucius started talking about how to be a good human being. And he taught us many, many things. I'd like to share the first idea that he presented, which is called Li. That is how we should treat people with respect and with humility. Li is very important in China. We do it very easily by showing you a good gesture like this. He also talked about yue, which is music. We think it's very important that we fill our lives with music. A few decades ago, this entire set of musical bells was discovered in the province of Hubei. When people discovered this whole piece, they couldn't figure out what this whole piece was about until they found some actual musical notes. So this is music demonstrated by hitting different parts of the bells, different sounds will come out. So this is a way to show different music. Music is a very important part of the Chinese Cultural Center. One part of the development of a human being is to develop his inner energy. And this is done through the exercise such as Tai Chi. And this area, the space is wide open for us to practice Tai Chi. And the Chinese Cultural Center provides Tai Chi classes for our students, faculty, and staff, and also visitors. Tea is a very important part of the Chinese culture. The Chinese people use a cup of tea to show their welcome, to also develop human relationships. This is very crucial to understand. The Chinese Cultural Center offers you a great cup of tea. Enjoy. Calligraphy is a very important part of the Chinese culture. Here at the Chinese Cultural Center, we showcase a piece of calligraphy with carving and also poetry and also lacquer, a combination of many forms of arts into one piece. The abacus is a Chinese national treasure. 2,000 years ago, Mr. Liu Hong invented the abacus. It is also a world heritage. Most Chinese people enjoy learning the abacus. Um. 
I hope you've enjoyed the virtual tour of the Chinese Cultural Center at San Diego State University. The Terracotta Soldier and I bid you farewell. All right, so I hope that for those of you who haven't been to our center, this show video clip to give you an idea of what is uh, Chinese Cultural Center, what we are doing and about the six arts. All right, so now I would like to pass the microphone to our uh, today's speaker, Yudan Wang and our uh, special guest, special speaker, uh, Chang Yunhe. Uh, they will uh, share with, with you about the Chinese cuisine. Thank you. It's my great honor to uh, introduce our pretty lady, Miss Yunhe Chang from China. She is very into cooking Chinese food and Chinese cuisine culture. Let's welcome Yunhe Chang. Thank you, thank you, Yudan, thank you, Muting. I'm Yunhe, so you can call me Yunhe because Yunhe is my first name. And I'm very honored to be here today to introduce all of you the uh, Chinese cuisine culture. And for today, I'm going to introduce it from uh, four perspectives. And uh, before that, I'd like to ask all of you some questions about Chinese food. The first one, mm, have you eaten or seen any Chinese food before? And uh, when I uh, mention to the Chinese cuisine, so what's the first thing pops up your mind? Okay, so let's say the, the, the first PowerPoint of, of my PowerPoint and uh, um, look at this. Do you think of this, the Panda X Prize? Yeah, right. The first thing pops up your mind. And uh, Yudan, can I, uh, can I click the PowerPoint or you will do that for me? Sorry. Hello, Yudan, I'm not able to PowerPoint. No, I, I, I will uh, 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 do the point point for you. Okay, so can you, uh, can we move to the, the second page of, of the PowerPoint? Thank you. Uh, but but I, <laughs> I can see, see it. Can you see the second page? Uh, no. <laughs> no? No. Uh, 没有, 在我这里, Oh, it's uh, Muting. Muting, can you say? Uh, can you uh close the sh sharing and reshare it again? Oh, okay. mm -hmm. or, or do you need I sharing my screen? Let me try one more time. Okay. You okay. Oh, uh, uh, the before one. This one? The, the, the before page. Yes, yes, this one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So it's uh, the Panda Express. So uh, I think the Panda is a kind of symbol of Chinese culture, right? Of, of China. Um, but I have to say the Panda Express is not. <laughs> so uh, another question is, uh, have you heard of these? names of Chinese dishes like next picture, next page. Yeah, like lion head and as on the tree and the cup along. <laughs> I know when you uh, read these names, you will think, wow, there is nothing, nothing Chinese people don't eat, right? <laughs> but I have to say, I have to say uh, you never, be fooled by the names of Chinese dishes. Actually, they are all meat, all normal meat. So they are all made from pork and beef. Yes, it's, it's, it's pork and the cablon is made of beef. Okay, we go to next one. And 
So for now, I'd like to uh, introduce the part one, the special food for various festival. And uh, I think some of you must know uh, there are various Chinese festival in, um, in, in China, right? And also we eat different food for different festivals. For example, the, the most one and the, the uh, popular one is the spring festival. Uh, on that day, we will eat dumplings. And then we go to the next one. Uh, we have the Latin festival and we will eat the glutinous rice bowl for that day. And in, and in spring, uh, there are some, you know, fresh and and juicy vegetables. So we uh, make the glue uh, the green rice bowl with them for the uh, Tom's Weeping Festival. And for the next, we are ha we have Dragon Boat Festival. And on that day, we will eat zongzi. So Yu Dan, you can click it. So Yu Dan, please click the yeah. Okay, the, the, the name of the food will come out. Okay, so we eat zongzi for the Dragon Boat Festival. And the zongzi is the um, sticky rice dumpling wrapped in bamboo leaves. So it's, um, I think it's a unique Chinese food. <laughs> and for the last one, uh, Mid Autumn Festival, also we call it Mooncake Festival because on that day, we will eat mooncake to celebrate that day. Okay, so we go to next one. And uh, yeah, so for now, we are going to the part two, four major cuisines. And according to different climates and uh, the geographical location, uh, Chinese people divide the uh, cuisine into four major cuisines. And let's have a look for the next one. Uh, we have a regional, we have a, a, a regional map actually. So from this video, you will understand softly what's the full cuisine like. Okay, so enjoy this video. So, okay. So I, uh, I am sharing my video, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. Is yes. So. Okay. What is Chinese food? It's much more than just stir fries, noodles, and dumplings. Up until the last decade or so, Chinese restaurants in the West haven't been very diverse. But China itself is, in its climate, geography, culture, and consequently, its food. This is our breakdown of regional Chinese cuisines. For simplicity's sake, we've divided China into four regions, north, south, east, and west. The food in the north, because of the cold climate, is heavy on meat and carbs. The southern seaboard is rich with seafood, and the regions around the Yangtze River Delta in the east are teeming with river fish and crustaceans. Meanwhile, the tropical southwest is lush with vegetation. Still, it's difficult to categorize Chinese food. Provincial borders are not the best markers, as many of them have shifted over time with the rise and fall of dynasties. Now, Chinese food can be broken down into many different categories, but certain regions' cuisines have become dominant simply because of their international reach. Generally speaking, China has two main carbs, wheat and rice, and their prevalence follows a north-south divide. Rice requires a lot of water, and the south gets plenty of it, with more rain on average than the north. Therefore, rice is consumed more in the south, and the north specializes in wheat because it doesn't need all that much water. In the north, you'll see a lot of wheat noodle dishes and quite a bit of buns. In the south, you'll see a lot of fried rice, rice noodles, and rice noodle rolls. Let's zoom into the south. The southeast, including Guangdong province and Hong Kong, is home to Cantonese cuisine. The flavor profile here tends to be salty and sweet, and because of its proximity to the sea, there's a lot of seafood. 
This region is also the birthplace of oyster sauce and hoisin sauce, and people here are really good at making sweet barbecued meat. Cantonese cuisine also includes dim sum, a class of small brunch bites powered by steam. Think rice noodle rolls and delicate shrimp dumplings wrapped in tapioca flour. Just above is the east. Among the four regional cuisines, it is the sweetest. Fish is deep fried and ladled with sweet and sour sauce, and pork ribs are coated with soy sauce and sugar. Its proximity to a lush network of waterways has earned it the moniker Land of Fish and Rice. Freshwater fish and crustaceans tend to dominate the menu. It also happens to be the home of soup dumplings, or xiaolongbao, and yangzhou fried rice. Over in the west, you have a lush area that's known for its subtropical climate, pandas, and spicy food. Fresh greens are abundant here, and the flavor profile is spicy and numbing. This is also the home of the Sichuan peppercorn, a Chinese spice that will literally numb the tongue. And finally, we have the north. Leafy greens are harder to find here. Potatoes, eggplant, onions, and cabbage tend to be the plants of choice. Meat is dominant, especially beef and lamb. And because it's a wheat-heavy region, noodles, buns, and dumplings are everywhere. You'll see dishes like lamb dumplings and beef noodle soup. So there you have it. A very simple breakdown to the four most prominent regions of Chinese cuisine. Coming up, we'll be doing. Okay, so from the video, you can you can know according to the different tastes, uh, we in the we divided the Chinese cuisine into four main cuisines, right? Sichuan cuisine, Shandong cuisine, Cantonese cuisine, and Huai Huaiyang cuisines. So first, I want to show you. The very popular and the most important is Sichuan cuisine, like this. And let uh let you understand the um the the, the feature of Sichuan cuisine. So I will show you a short video. Tingly spicy, chili oil spicy, sour spicy, fish spicy. These are some of the over 20 traditional flavors of Sichuan cuisine. Traditional Sichuan dishes emphasize bold flavors, pungent aromas, and vibrant colors. Sichuan cuisine holds that there are six fundamental tastes. Tingly spicy, hot spicy, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Combining these six tastes in different ways yields over 20 compound tastes. But harmonizing different flavors is the key to a well-balanced meal. The tingly spicy flavor refers to the signature Sichuan peppercorn, which produces a tingly numbing sensation similar to a mild electric shock. When combined with oil, chili peppers, and other spices, it brings out the intense aromatic heat of dishes like Kung Pao chicken, twice cooked pork, and Mapo tofu. Of course, if you order these dishes at an American Chinese restaurant, they may tone it down for your sake. Sichuan province is located in southwest China and was home to a unique civilization dating back over 3,000 years. After Emperor Qin Shi Huang unified China under his rule, immigrants from central China gradually came to Sichuan and developed the traditional Sichuan cuisine. Today, Sichuan dishes are well known around the world for their rich, complex, and spicy flavors. Okay, so you you can from you can learn about from this video the obvious feature of Sichuan cuisine is spicy. There are all types of spicy food in Sichuan cuisine, like spicy hot pot and the ma po tofu. Okay, let's move to the second one, Shandong cuisine. Let's look at the the video and learn about what is Shandong cuisine like. Traditional Shandong cuisine dates back to the Yuan dynasty of the 13th century AD, but its roots stretch back even earlier. Nestled in the cradle of Chinese civilization, 
Shandong province has a history over 4,000 years long and contains the birthplace of Confucius and the sacred Mount Tai. Located along China's east coast and the mouth of the Yellow River, a variety of fresh seafood and produce are available year-round. Perhaps as a consequence, chefs are extremely selective when choosing their main ingredients. And throughout their preparation, the cut, color, and taste of the main ingredients are preserved. One of the four ancient texts on Chinese medicine describes the area around Shandong as the oriental realm where the heaven and earth originated, the land of fish and salt surrounded by river and sea where people are fond of fish and salty taste. Fish and pork are staples of the Shandong diet and are prepared in a variety of ways. One popular method called bao is to quickly stir-fry the food in a wok with boiling oil under extremely high heat. Because the heat from the flames is so high, the food is light and crispy instead of oily and much of the nutrition is preserved. In Chinese restaurants, the flames shoot up so high it's a wonder that chefs don't singe their eyebrows. Another feature of Shandong cuisine is soup which comes in clear and white varieties. Popular Shandong dishes include scallion braised sea cucumber, shredded pork with Peking sauce, and sweet and sour carp. Okay, so you can see the feature of this cuisine is salty, rich in flavor. So I think Shandong cuisine is the most historical cuisine of these four ones. And the typical and popular cuisines, uh, dishes like this, braised prawns and uh, braised sea cucumber. Okay, let's move to, after that, let's move to the south of China, Huayang cuisine. And uh, video first. Huayang cuisine emerged from the ancient city of Yangzhou near China's east coast. Yangzhou has been an economic and cultural center for over 2,000 years. During China's golden age in the Tang Dynasty, the city was so rich that it was called the most prosperous city under heaven. Perhaps reflecting the sweetness of life's blessings, Huayang food is often slightly sweet and rarely spicy. Pork and freshwater fish are staples. Preparation methods are often elaborate but the seasoning is light and used only to enhance the natural flavors of the main ingredients. One exception to this is the locally produced Shenjiang vinegar, which has a rich smoky flavor and just a hint of sweetness. Preparation methods like stewing, braising, and steaming are also used to awaken the food's natural flavors, while frying is less common. Popular dishes include oiled quick-fried shrimp, lion's head meatball, and chrysanthemum herring. Geographically positioned between the north and south, Huayang cuisine is admired throughout China for its balance between light and heavy tastes and between salty and sweet flavors. Okay, so due to its proximity to the lake and the river, so there are uh, there is many uh, seafood in Huayang cuisine, like this picture, the fish and the crab. And also, because the Huayang area is uh, rich in green tea, so there will be some, uh, some, some tea in this uh, cuisine, like this, shrimp with longjing tea. And for the last one, the Cantonese cuisine, and uh, we can say Yang Cha. Yam cha and uh, dim sum uh, for Cantonese language. <laughs> and uh, I introduce you the Cantonese, lang uh, Cantonese quiz cuisine from this video. Light but not tasteless, fresh but not vulgar, tender but not raw, moist but not greasy. This is the taste of traditional Cantonese food. 
Canton, or Guangdong province, has been a major trading port since the Ming Dynasty in the 14th century AD. The subtropical climate and year-round availability of meat, fish, and produce led to a fetish of freshness and exotic ingredients. Another feature of Cantonese cuisine is complicated recipes with many steps. But the seasoning is generally light and never overpowers the fresh, natural taste of the food itself. Dried and preserved ingredients, however, are often used along with fresh meats and vegetables to add a depth of flavor. Traditional Cantonese dishes include steamed grouper, beef with oyster sauce, After this part, we are going to the next part, the, the third one, table manners. And uh, for this one, uh, um, let's welcome Yu Dan Lao to introduce this part, okay? So thank you for listening for today. That's all the content of my speech. Thank you, guys. So um, Yun He, you, you just need to um, stop sharing, screen sharing. <laughs> Hello, Yun He. Okay. <clears throat> So it's very interesting, very delicious. Wow, uh, we can see the four uh, different uh, Chinese cuisine that's from the different parts of China, uh, which they have uh, the location because the location and geography features. So the, the food is very different. So when you go to China, try to go to, you know, east, west, um, um, south and north. So you can experience different food. But now China is like all over, you can uh, taste different food in one place, in one um, 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 uh, city, they're all there. Uh, and now I, I can uh, just a little bit uh, taste of the Chinese table manner. The... You're about to sit down to a nice Chinese meal. Let me just know here, a bite there, a and all of a sudden, you and your family are shamed, food. and bad luck is upon all of you. How did that happen? Well, let me start by saying that eating is a huge part of Chinese culture. We eat to celebrate, to honor guests, to socialize, and to strengthen bonds. So doing it the right way is very important. Good manners indicate proper upbringing and invites good luck. Poor etiquette is bad luck and embarrassing for you and the people that should have taught you better, i.e. your parents. And we all know how well that would sit with the tiger mother. Fear not friends, today I'm going to go through a list of eight proper ways to eat a delicious Chinese meal without bringing shame to your family. Number one, where to sit. See, before you even sit down for your meal, it's important to show the proper respect to the host as well as the guest of honor. You do this by not occupying the seat of honor, which is the center seat facing the entrance. Then the second most important person sits to his or her right side, the third most on his or her left side, and so on. The person footing the bill usually sits in the least prominent position, opposite the guest of honor. Number two, how to order. Chinese meals are traditionally family style, where everyone shares all the dishes with one person ordering for the whole table. Sometimes the host will order a few dishes and ask the guests to each order an additional dish. If you're the one ordering, make sure to get a variety and make sure it's an even number. An odd number of dishes is traditionally reserved for funeral meals, and that is bad luck. Number three and four, how to pour tea and how to show gratitude. Even with tea, there's a proper way to pour and drink it. It's polite to pour for those around you by taking the teapot handle in your right hand and then placing your left hand on the lid. This shows that you are honoring the person you're pouring for and keeps the lid from falling off. When the tea is out, leave the lid partially off and at the side of the table to indicate to the waitstaff that a refill is needed. Taking the lid entirely off is, you guessed it, bad luck. And if someone is pouring tea for you, a verbal thank you is necessary. Or if conversation is flowing, a verbal thank you may be disruptive. So you can take your index and middle finger 
bend them and tap them on the table. This is an acceptable show of gratitude that started in ancient times. An emperor was said to have gone undercover with two secret service-like servants in tow to observe his kingdom and how it was doing. At a restaurant, the emperor pours tea to his aides. Normally, they would kneel down on the ground and bow in gratitude. However, this would blow his covers. So instead, they bow with their fingers on the table like this. Number five, chopsticks handling. As difficult as they are to hold, proper chopsticks handling is a must. So take the time to learn how to use them correctly and avoid unintentional bad behavior. <laughs> chopsticks are seen as an extension to your fingers, so never point them directly at anyone. It's considered rude. Also, never leave the chopsticks sticking upright off the dishes as it looks like incense in food dishes left in honor of the dead. Bad luck. Along those lines is number six how to eat your food. Chinese meals are usually served on a lazy Susan to make family style eating all the more easy. When a dish is served, the senior most person gets first stab at it and then it's rotated around the table. It's polite to only take a small portion to make sure everyone gets some. And number seven, how to eat fish. Fish is usually served at Chinese meals as the term have fish or you yu sounds the same as you yu, which means surplus. Having a surplus is lucky. Nian nian you yu is a common phrase used during Chinese New Year to wish someone good fortune and surplus year after year. When a fish is served whole, once one side is eaten, never flip the fish over. This custom started in Chinese fishing communities when the fish symbolizes a boat. So flipping it over indicates flipping the livelihood over. So how do you get to the other side? Simply use your chopsticks and grab the backbone and lift up. Set it on the side of the dish and voila, more deliciousness to consume. Last but not least, lucky number eight. Can you pay my bills? How to pay the bill is a very intricate process and the most important custom to note. Guests should never ever split the bill with the host. It's very ungracious because it's as if you're saying that the host cannot afford the bill or that you do not accept his or her hospitality. Super rude. Now the host is supposed to pay for the meal, but you have to offer to pay for the meal at least a few times. The more sincere looking the mock effort, the better. Now don't get all into it and really pay the bill because that would be rude too. And don't just sit back and accept that he or she is paying even though that is what is really happening because that would make it seem like you expect them to pay and that they owe you somehow. So dance to dance and offer to pay, graciously allow the host to pay, then thank them sincerely. So that's our top eight list on what to do at a Chinese meal to bring honor to your family and good luck for all, all while filling your belly with scrumptious eats. Win, win, win. If you haven't seen our Chopsticks vs. Fork video or our epic fight. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting uh, table manner of Chinese culture. Uh, never, never flip the fish and never sleep the bill with the host. <laughs> okay. Uh, any question for today's uh, presentation? Uh, you can uh just uh unmute yourself or you know put in the chat box okay thank you so much for today uh joining us and next month we are going to uh introduce tea chinese tea and tea um ceremony uh, we will stay tuned. We will have more detailed information posted. Okay, thank you so much for today. Um, have a good weekend.